Praise the Lord. Well, if you don't know, that was Bob Bowling's favorite hymn, and it was sung on Friday. I invite you to turn this morning to Psalm 86. Psalm 86. Good to see you here. Welcome visitors in our midst this morning. Glad you're with us. Whatever brings you into our midst today, we hope to see you again. We're going through the book of Hebrews, but I felt that what I wanted to say in the next message in that series just wasn't really the most appropriate way to prepare ourselves for the Lord's table. And so my mind was turned to a text that I actually preached at Carlin's brother's funeral here in Psalm 86. So we're going to consider it. I have obviously dealing with it a little differently, but let us let's hear the word of the Lord. We'll read all of this psalm together. Psalm 86, bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Among the gods there is none like unto thee, O Lord, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great, and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul and have not set thee before them. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thine handmaid. Show me a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed because thy Lord has opened me and comforted me. Amen. Let's pray. God, give help in your word. There is no God like our God. And we pray today that we might see something of your majesty and be brought to a place of wonder, especially before we sit at the table. So give help, give the power of the Spirit, and move in this place revealing yourself. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God is able to bring good out of evil, isn't he? I mean, really, this is the a simple way of looking at the history from God's perspective given to us in the Word. God bringing good out of evil. It's not always easy to see. It's not always easy for us to understand what's going on, but pull back, see the big picture, and God is bringing evil or bringing good out of evil. We sang from Psalm 51 deliberately this morning. As many of you know, the backdrop to that psalm isn't exactly something you would want to be written over your life. The experience of David, the man after God's own heart, the man who perhaps in his generation walked in closer fellowship with God than any other man. And yet he falls 
Oh, so hard does he fall. Adultery, the conniving, planning, plotting of wickedness, the ultimate murder of Uriah. It's a blot indeed. And as guilty as he was, he works in David's heart, gives to us such psalms as the one we sang in part together, Psalm 51. And now, countless millions, constantly, across the world, all the time, receive comfort. Now, if we were the recipients or on the receiving end of what David did, we might not feel just as we do about it today. If it was our family hurt, if it was our family plotted against for their death and so on, we would feel passionately that what David did was so wrong, perhaps we might never be able to bring ourselves to forgive him. But we're a little distant from that. We're not personally hurt by what David did. And so instead we read Psalm 51 and we're able to see it through other eyes. We're able to see it from the perspective of those that can identify not with David in his holiness and his obedience and his nearness to God, but we can identify with his sin. We can identify with those periods of our lives when we, we wish it could be deleted. We wish it never happened. We wish it wasn't so. And so we're comforted. And we learn, reading Psalm 51, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. But the same man pens this psalm also, Psalm 86. You see it, a prayer of David. And in this psalm, he includes lots of things. There's, there's much, this is packed, but it's verse 5 I want us to think about before we sit at the Lord's table. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. If you call me and say I have an unsaved family member lying in a hospital bed, and I don't know really where they stand before God, they have no strong credibility of profession of faith in Christ, the likelihood is I'm going to turn to this text and read it with them. I did that, as I mentioned, when I went to see Carlin's brother. I did it in Calgary with at least one individual I remember having to go and sit by the bedside not knowing and certainly with little evidence of any saving knowledge of Christ. You know, because people lie in that moment and they're they're, they're dicing with death, as it were. They're, they're staring it in the face. They're being warned, told by the medical staff things are not good. They feel it. It's almost like they can feel life slipping away. And then they begin to think. They begin to mull over, no doubt. Part of their thoughts may be trying to resist the sense of, how have I lived? Where am I going? Is there eternity? How will I fare before God? And perhaps in all those thoughts, there's a sense of, I wish I knew that I'm ready to meet God. But there's no way after 60, 70, 80 years of unbelief and rejection, there's no way that He would save me. And it's a text like this they need to hear. Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon Thee. This is how David saw God. This is how I want you to see God. If you come into God's house today, you come and sit here feeling unworthy, thinking that there's no possible way there is hope for me, maybe questioning whether you should sit at the Lord's table because maybe not of anything the session is aware of, maybe not anything that anyone is aware of except for you, and wondering, should I participate today? I am here to tell you, if there is that call of repentance from your heart, this is the God that you come to. 
the one who is good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon him. So, we're looking at this text this morning under the title, The God You Can Trust. The God You Can Trust. Not many you can trust. And oftentimes we have our our trust abused, our hopes dashed, even by those nearest and dearest to us. The last thing I'd want you to do is to take your experience of your interactions with men and come to a cynical position that says, I can't trust anyone, and then throw that onto God as well. I can't trust God. Because you can. You can. So though, firstly, the goodness of God. The goodness of God. This is what David sees. This is what he knows. This man who knew God, fell tragically, but this, this is what he knows. Thou, Lord, art good. Thou art good. Now, we can think of this in different ways. First, we might talk about the essential goodness of God. That relates to God good in His being. It's the idea that anything that is perfect must be good. Otherwise, it wouldn't be perfect. And since God is perfect, it stands the reason He is good. He is good in His essence. His, his being is good. Something of this may be seen in the interaction Moses has with God in Exodus 33. You may wish to turn there. It's a well-known passage, but one that we ought to be familiar with. When Moses is praying, a very bold prayer, when he says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Exodus 33, verse 18. Show me thy glory. Reveal yourself to me, Lord. God said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But you see what he says, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. It's not, it's dealing with who God is. This, the, the French reformer John Calvin says here that it's more about the beauty of God. That's the sense of the language, but I mean, he's looking at it in its context. I don't think he's necessarily wrong, but I don't think it's wrong to translate it as goodness as well. The, the beauty is, is the goodness of God is his beauty. That's normally how the word is translated with relation to the idea of, of good or goodness. But, but when his, his goodness is being presented to Moses and he's seeing something of his goodness, you know, Calvin's right, there's, there's something attractive or beautiful about what it is that's being revealed to Moses. And so God causes him to see something of, of his essence and, and described in this way. The goodness of God. And this is the same God that David had interacted with and knew as well. He maybe didn't have the precise experiences that Moses had, but he had his experiences and he was able to say, Thou art good. He knew it. He believed it. He was convinced of it. But also his ethical goodness. When you consider the, the goodness of God, you can consider it ethically. That is how God communicates His goodness to His creation. He reveals that He is good. It's not just some objective truth. God is good. That's who He is. But how does He relate to His creation? How does His creation see that goodness? And this comes into the ethical aspect. There are many passages that deal with this. For example, in Psalm 145, Verse 9, the Lord is good to all. So it's not just that He is good, but He is good to all. He is showing His goodness. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. So God shows, reveals His goodness to this world. I know it's often hidden, isn't it? Hidden behind a blanket of all sorts of bad news and things we wish were not so. But 
But he is. God is still good. And you see it in how he deals with his, not just all of his creatures, but how he deals with his moral or rational creatures. When Jesus reveals in Matthew 5, verse 45, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So Jesus isn't just dealing with the rain coming upon the entirety of creation. Of course, that's true. God's goodness to the entirety of creation. But, but he's, he hones in on rational creatures, those capable of good and evil, those capable of being just and unjust. And so we might look at you know, the plains of the Serengeti. We might look at the general creation of God and say, you know, I can understand God would pour His rain there and provide for these creatures. They're not, they're not morally wrong. They're, they haven't broken God's law because they're not rational creatures. But then we look at other places in the world where we see great crimes and sin and wickedness and abomination. And if we were in control of the weather, the rain wouldn't fall in some places. Now, the rain doesn't fall in some places. That's true. And you start reading history and looking at various aspects of life in different parts of this world, you'll quickly find out that places that were once abundant are deserts today. Is that, is that the judgment of God? Is that God's long-suffering being stretched to a point in which now He has withheld rain from that area? All the talk about global warming, and you know, obviously opinions are all over the place as to the reasons why, but generally speaking, there is a sense that, yeah, yeah I mean, I was just reading the other day, all the, 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 the ski resorts are kind of in a panic because especially over in France this year, the temperatures have been warmer, the precipitation instead of being snow has been rain, things are, things, it's just not good for the, the, the skiing economy. So you see change in climate, climate does change, but it's, it's not ultimately man, it's God. God does bring different seasons and experiences to this world, but generally speaking, you still see it. You still see it, that, that there are places that you think, well, if I was in control, I wouldn't so lavish that kind of weather on those kind of people. But God does. He does. And He uses it. It's meant to be a message, isn't it? Isn't it? When, when we live, look at this land, look at... Look at this nation. And you can see the departure from God, the, the immorality that abounds, the wickedness that is so freely performed. Not, not obviously there are things that go on behind closed doors, but there's things just publicly and, and in your face being done that, that, as I've said before, your grandparents wouldn't have spoken of. You want to mention it. The unmentionable things that go on. Now it's put in front of you and as a legitimate way of living. And yet God is still good. Look at this nation. It's abundance. Unbelievable abundance. And what is, what is God saying to America amidst all of its rebellion and rejection and flagrant wickedness, and yet constantly still the markets haven't crashed, the currency is still carrying on, the, the grain is still coming in, there's still food, and I know you're looking at the eggs and all of that, and you see, well, maybe, maybe there's little warning shots, let's say, but, but there's still a lot of abundance. My wife is looking at it, and she's thinking, <laughs> I need to cut my two eggs in the morning down to one. 
because of all that's going on. And yet God, as I say, is still, still very merciful. Why? Why? Why is he short? Romans 2, 4. Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing. This, this is what we misunderstand. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So when God lavishes, as we talk about his ethical goodness, when he is showing, thou Lord art good, and you're living in this nation where you don't have to think about where your next meal is coming from, not in the way others do. You can't even put yourself in the shoes of, of a third of the population of this world. You don't even understand what it's like to live as they live. We don't. None of us. We don't get it. Even those of us who are struggling a bit, we don't understand. And what's it saying? That God is giving a message that should lead us to repentance. And so we need to be told what to do. What? Thou art good. So what? What am I to do? You're here this morning. Okay, God is good. He's good in His being. He's good to this world. What am I to do? Psalm 107, verse 31. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. You're being told what to do. Praise the Lord for His goodness. So when David declares, Thou art good, what are you to do? You're to respond in praise. Especially when you look at yourself and you then acknowledge Romans 3, was it verse 12? There is none good, no, not one. Among us, we are not good. So, the goodness of God, that's part of what we see. This God that you can trust, it is first because He is good, also because He is generous, the generosity of God. Again, look at verse 5 of Psalm 86. Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy. When we think of the generosity of God, firstly, generous in forgiveness. Ready to forgive. When the Bible talks about forgiveness, sometimes it's about relationships between men. And it's teaching us how we are called to forgive. You, you boys and girls, you, this is something that you're taught to, when you fight and squabble to say sorry and seek forgiveness and reconcile. It's an important lesson in life. And to be able to move on. Isn't it? Well, you know, we teach our kids this. and <laughs> By and large... You know, they go through and they, they squabble and they fight and then you bring them in and you talk about it and of course one's blaming the other for this and that and all the rest of it. You have to navigate and negotiate and, you know, counsel them through it all. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it a wonder? And is it not a message to every one of us older how five minutes later they're getting on as if nothing happened? They're just, they've just moved on. Enjoying each other's company. You get, add 10 years to them, and all of a sudden, you, you, you can't get people to think and act that way. They, they won't do it. And they'll try to justify it in all sorts of ways that we wouldn't tolerate in our children. Wouldn't. Wouldn't tolerate it. No. No, no, no. Forgive. But at other times, the Bible speaks of God's forgiveness, and that's what's being dealt with here. It's God being ready to forgive. Being ready to forgive. Ready. I was thinking about that. Ready to forgive. Have you ever, you ever applied for a job and you're kind of anxiously waiting for the email or the phone call or whatever it is to tell you that you've got the job? You know, and they would say, well, when can you start? And you're, you're at a position in your life, well, yesterday. <laughs> like you're ready. Or, or if you've played sports, and you're, you're just anxious to get into the first team, into the starting team. And you get, you get that indication, you know, 
like want you to start in the team in our next game or whatever. And you're just, you're just ready. Just, you've been waiting for it. You're just, yes. I've been looking forward to this. You're ready. And that is how David describes God's forgiveness, that he is right there. Just, just in a moment, he's just ready. He's not going to make you wait and wonder and just languishing in a period of doubt. He's ready to forgive first opportunity, he is going to forgive. <laughs> Isn't that good? Can you think of it that way? And I'm wondering, well, how ready is he to forgive me today? Maybe I need to go and do some penance and come back and have communion next month and leave at this. No! <laughs> he is ready to forgive! Oh, this is great. I love this. To stand up and preach to you this morning, coming in with a load of sin, Wondering whether you can sit at the Lord's table because of thoughts and actions and words and all sorts of things. And you're, but you're sitting there saying, yes, yes, I want, to, I want to seek forgiveness from God. I want to be cleansed. I want to make it right. And I want deliverance. And then the question is, well, how, how quickly can I have it? No. Instantly. It can be yours. He is ready to forgive. We're not always ready to forgive, but he is. I was, you, know, you take yourself to the cross. You see Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dying on the cross, suffering at the hands of men. Oh, so cruelly, so cruelly. He is suffering, and he is suffering, and he is suffering. We can't even imagine the suffering and agony of Jesus Christ on that cross. And what does he say? As he suffers under the hands of wicked men, as he is the object of their mockery and hatred and wickedness and cruelty, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We talk about trauma and saying, I need time to think about this in order for me to get to a place where I'm ready to forgive. You've never had trauma like that. Never. Never. And he is ready to forgive. He is calling the Father. Be ready to forgive. So he is generous in forgiveness, ready to forgive. Don't forget it. But he's also generous in mercy. Plenteous in mercy. Mercy immediately brings to mind the, the, real, the reality that one has power and authority and is in a position to execute judgment and justice and so on. So God is seen as this one who has power. He is judge. And they're the children of men. And they need to be judged. And they're sinful and they're wicked. And yet he is plenteous in mercy. In other words, the imagery is he's pulling back on the judgment they deserve. He's restraining in the judgment they deserve. Being plenteous in mercy. Overflowing with mercy. Endlessly, it would appear, constantly showing mercy. So all the mercy that men need is available because God is plenteous in mercy. You say, well, 
I have, I have sinned and sought God and sinned and sought God and sinned and sought God. Can I, can I get to a point where there's no more mercy left? Can I? Is our Lord not teaching us to be like Him when He says, when, when the interaction with the disciples, you know, how many times should we forgive? Seventy times, seven. <laughs> In other words, just you keep on. Plenteous in mercy. Yeah, we struggle with that, but that's, that's the God that David sees. He has plenty of some mercy. I keep coming. He keeps receiving. It's a, he's not going to exact the judgment I deserve. No, he may discipline. And he does. But he doesn't, he doesn't take every opportunity to exact all the judgment you deserve. He doesn't. Look at the text. Dear friend here today, look at it. Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy. Is that what you believe about God? Is that the God you've heard about? Is that the God you know? How do you think about God? How do you see God? When I say God, and we, you know, we sang that, that hymn, who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who has grace so rich and free? And you're maybe saying to yourself, I don't understand that. You know, there, there are believers here this morning singing that, and it's like their heart is bursting. It's like, yes, this is, this is great. Oh, praise God. And then there are others, I imagine, it would be great if it wasn't the case, but I imagine there are others and we're singing it and, and you're kind of like, well, why are we repeating it again? You know, like, what's, what's the big deal? <laughs> you don't see it. You don't see it. <laughs> you haven't experienced it. Oh. Despise us thou the goodness of God, do you? Oh, please don't despise it. See it. See it. Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. And plenteous in mercy. No, it's not promising. It's not promising that life will be easy. It's not promising that you will always be in the receiving end of the kindness of people. But it doesn't change it. Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy. Finally, the graciousness of God. The graciousness of God. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous of mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Unto all them that call upon thee. So we've spent time thinking about who God is and how he's presented in this text. But that's all just information and details. What are you to do with it? What response does it garner? There's something known as the, uh, the banker's paradox. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. The banker's paradox is a title given to an experience when when you most need a loan, like you're in dire straits and most need a loan, that's when you're at risk and the bank is unlikely to give you the loan that you're looking for. Like you're, you're desperate. The bank looks at you and says, no, you're a risk. Not going to give it. On the flip side, when you're doing okay, and you couldn't meet the demands of life materially and so on, the bank's coming to you and say, hey, do you want a loan? <laughs> we'll give you a loan. How much do you want? Well, I don't, I don't really need it. Oh, but, but we'll give it to you. That's the banker's paradox. It happens in other ways too. You know, you think of it in terms of uh, kind of the, 
the way our celebrity culture is. You know, it's people who are already famous that get the platforms to get their message out, isn't it? Whereas someone who maybe have the, has the perfect message, has the message that needs to get out to the world, like a lowly preacher of the word, you know, there's like, no, no, you don't have the platform. So, so the people who have the platform can continue to ask and request and get the big broadcasts to give them attention when they don't really need it. They already have a massive platform. So there's different ways in which it applies. But I was thinking about how unlike that is as far as how, how God works. He, he's, the bank will give you money when you don't need it. And when you really need it, withhold it from you. Or the world and its media empire will give you attention when you don't really need it. You have all the attention you could ask for, but then shut you out when you would have good cause to have that attention and get your message out. But that's, not, that's not how God deals with us. He does not offer forgiveness to those who don't need it. It's more like, oh, you're, you're in debt. I see your debt. But, but here's the answer. There's, there's no risk. He doesn't sense any risk. He's not, he's not kind of holding back and, and making calculations whether or not he's going to forgive you. No. The Lord is good and ready to forgive and plenty of some mercy unto all that call. In other words, you, you call up, you know, anyone calls a bank, can I get a loan? Sure. I want you to see that's, that's what God, what David sees in God. That when a needy sinner sees the debt of a sin and no way out and calls to God, this is what they're met with. A God who's good, ready to forgive, and plenty of mercy. There couldn't be a better message, could there? Could there? What you're saying, me, me, preacher, you don't even know the darkness of my past. No, and I don't have to. I am not a Roman Catholic priest who offers to you my power to forgive and reconcile you to God. That is in the hand of the only priest that matters, Jesus Christ. And that's why you're exhorted. That's why David, David, who's, who's he turning to? He's turning to God. Thou, Lord, art good. Well, the, the priest might be good, and he might be ready to forgive, and he might be plenty of some mercy, but he's not the one I turn to. It's thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenty of some mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Friends, I want you to see how that text puts its arms around you. Every one of you. That, that, that verse is putting its arm around you, and it's asking, asking you whether or not you consider yourself in the place where you're going to call. Because if you don't call, if you don't ask, you're not going to receive. If you meander through life, carrying on, ignoring God, maybe saying to yourself, well, at some point, at some point, I'll call out to God. Or maybe looking at it this way, well, if, if, if God intends me to be saved He'll do it in my heart. He'll make it happen. That's not how Scripture presents the matter. It presents the matter in terms of human responsibility. It presents the matter at your doorstep and says, you have to call. You have to call. You have a duty to call. So God presents himself. He's good. Ready to forgive? I mean, I'm looking at you wondering, like, why would you not? Like, <laughs> what reason could you possibly give to ignore this? To sit in the pews of this church and say to yourself, another day. Another day? This is the spiritual lottery. It's right there. It's like the winning ticket. It's just there. There you are. Everlasting freedom from the guilt of sin and shame. A sure hope of eternity with God. All sin put away in full. Salvation as a gift to be received. 
Just call. Just ask me for it. And yet men sit, ignoring it. Oh, don't, don't do it. Don't do it, boys and girls. Don't drift from Sunday to Sunday. Feeling the pangs in the conscience where God's dealing with your heart and just keep putting it off because you, you think you'll be here next Sunday too. God is saying, call. Call now. This is the message we need as we come to the Lord's table, is it not? Because the biggest burden we face in life is not, it is not the burden of what others have put us through. And, and people put us through things. They do. <clears throat> we, we, we are not long in this world before we realize that, that this is full of pain. And, and certainly some experience it more than others. But if I can get you, I, 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 can I ask you to trust me? Could I? Could I ask you to trust me? And I have studied this and thought about this and considered this for years. The biggest pain and challenge you are ever going to face in your life will be the one in your own heart. It's your own self. God is good, ready to forgive. It's like he's, he's anxious. He's, 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 I use that carefully. He's, he's just ready. He's right there. He, he's, he's, he's like the lad of scenes, isn't it? Remember the lad of scenes? Where they're, 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 they're taken up with all of their wealth and prosperity and comfort, and they're ignoring the Lord. And, and he's ready to forgive. What, how, does, how does he portray his readiness to forgive them? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm right here. Right here. At the door, knocking, calling, inviting, appealing. Oh, won't you respond? Stands over the multitudes, Jesus does. And he has such a broken heart, seeing them as sheep having no shepherd, having compassion on the multitude. And so he looks over this congregation in the same way. You look at Jesus in the eye and you can see in that eye you can look in that eye. We talk about sometimes, you know, there's people having a kind eye. There's a kindness in their eye. That's the eye I want you to see in Jesus Christ. There's a kindness in his eye unlike you have ever seen before. Because he's good, ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all who call upon him. Friend, will you call? Will you call this day? Maybe some of you I've preached to for, for years and you haven't yet called. Will you call today? Young person? Older person? Some of you are backslidden. You've been backslidden for longer than you can remember. This is a text for the backslider, isn't it? It's not putting any limitation. It's not saying, well, you've lived half-heartedly as a Christian for 10 years. Now there's no hope. It's not saying that. He is good, ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy. You know, it's like each statement, the arms go wider, isn't it? It's like, he's good, ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy. Unto all, he'll just take you all in. And reveal that this is the God you can trust. May the Lord help us. Let's bow together in prayer.
In just a moment, we'll sit at the Lord's table, and I encourage you to join with us for that little time together with the Lord. If you're not saved, you, you don't have to go. Just, just don't, take, don't take the bread, don't take the cup. But you can sit here and, and muse, think about the fact that you're not a Christian. You're not able to participate. And, and remedy that where you are. Just remedy it. Call out to God. Lord, we pray and give grace to us to believe the truth of this text and to not question what David understood. We pray that each one of us would commit this text to memory and when the accuser roars of ills that we've done, may this text be an anchor of our hope that we would rest that however however high the mountain of our sin appears to be the goodness of God is an Everest higher than all our sin showing that he is ready to forgive and plenteous of mercy unto all who call upon him Put your arms of forgiveness around this congregation, around the pain and the suffering of your people, and around the hurts of those that still are in unbelief. May they see and behold this God. 